like to announce to you about the uh, Cyarch Jazz Concert Series that we're having here. The first concert is November 4th and it will be the John Carter Octet. And from, my, from what I hear, it's supposed to be great, so we should all attend. Um, but tonight, I'd like to introduce you to you, an uh, architect from New York City. She is um, presently teaching at the Cooper Union, which is where she also attended um, undergraduate school. Um, she collaborates with Richard Scofidio, and um, let's see, she is a fellow of the Chicago Institute of Architecture and Urbanism, and um, what, she does a lot of experimental work, and she likes to call it um, performance architecture. Um, and most recently, she's had, had a show at the MoMA in New York City called Parasite. Um, she liked to tell me, she'd like me to tell you that afterwards, she'd rather just answer questions individually at the beer and cocktail area over there. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Elizabeth Diller. Thanks. Nothing personal, but <laughs> that was great. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. And um, I just had a very quick tour around the place, and I just want to say, from what I've seen, I love it here. Um, I'd like to get to know more about the school. But let's start with the lights off. I feel much more comfortable in the dark. Now, how do I, how do I make light here? When it lights on, okay, very good. Could you please level the projectors? <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> the body. Body bag, body count, body odor, body guard, body politic, body snatcher, body English, embody, disembody, antibody. The Vitruvian figure revised by da Vinci is male, symmetrical, static, elevational, and idealized. He is the essential part of an equation that unites him with nature and reason. He is the center of the grand abstraction, the measure of all things. His world is anthropocentric. His architecture is guided by the authority of his self-image. Schlemmer's figure, sexually less determinate, is set into motion, arrested in midair, x-rayed and robotic. Schlemmer's figure is ejected from center. There is no center. Only the crosshair of a moving instrument on a moving target. As modernism produced a rupture with historic continuity, it brought irreparable breakdowns in the classical foundations of order and reason. Anthropocentrism became merely a disturbing illusion. Schlemmer's figure is transient, his world is conditional, his architecture guided by speed, the machine, and a new plasticity. With the rejection of anthropocentrism, the body or the idea of the body was exiled from architectural discourse. The body has essentially been sub sublimated in the architecture of the 20th century. Since architecture has irrevocably broken away from anthropocentrism, can the discipline redefine its relationship to the re-emerging body? Cut. The writer surgeon Richard Selzer tells a true story of a surgeon he once knew. Dr. X had a passion for long midline incisions, from sternum to pubis no matter the need for that size opening. At some point in time, the surgeon had become annoyed by the presence of the navel, which he decided interrupted the pure line of the slice. Day in, day out, it must be gone around, either to the right or to the left. Soon what was at first an annoyance became a hated impediment that must be gotten rid of. 
mere circumvention was not enough. And so one day, having arrived at the midpoint of his downstroke, this surgeon paused to cut out the navel with a neat ellipse of the skin before continuing on down to the pubis. With such an elliptical incision when sutured at the close of the operation, it formed a continuous straight line without which the surgeon could not live. And once having cut out the navel and seeing the simple undeviate line of his closure, he vowed never again to leave a navel behind. If the navel of da Vinci's man in the mathematical center of his cosmic circle is a confirmation of his, of his unity with nature and a decipherable universe, this surgeon's deletion of the navel may serve as a base for a contemporary model of man to his uncertain world. The new scar obliterates the original scar, the evidence of entry into the world. Here, man's ultimate domination is perhaps nature's final exhaustion, the production of a body without origin. Cut. To cut, to penetrate with a sharp instrument, to divide into parts, sever, make unstable, to interrupt, discontinue, to hurt the feelings of, to shorten by omission, to make an abrupt transition from, transition from image to image, to perform surgery, to draw as an analytical drawing the solid resulting from its intersection with a plane. Consider the knife. Consider the knife of Vesalius, its flaying, excising, codifying. Topography is examined organically, feature by feature. Consider the pen of Vesalius. Consider the knife of da Vinci. It's abstract, it cuts along planes. There is no blood spilled. Da Vinci enters the body abstractly. The cut becomes a way of presenting and representing the body. Dissection leads to section cut. Consider the pen of da Vinci. Cut. Consider cutting the body, missing parts, and prosthetics. Prosthetics sometimes create resourceful asymmetries, like Mandelstam's character with Addison's disease. He drank vodka, played dice with a passion, and at night he took his wooden leg off and slept on it for a pillow. Prosthetics sometimes create frustrated symmetries, like Greenaway's character Alba in A Zed and Two Knots, who after the replacement of her amputated leg with a metal leg, was unhappy with her feigned symmetry. Her desire for perfect symmetry overwhelmed her desire to walk, so she had her remaining leg cut off. Consider substitutions, artificial limbs, artificial organs. The biological body is an anachronism. And consider the body without organs, from our toe. The body is the body, it is all by itself and has no need of organs. The body is never an organism. Organisms are enemies of the body. Artaud wants to establish an existence for the body in which all influence, all nature, and all culture are torn away from it so that it is itself honed down, bone and nerve, without family, God, or internal organs. The body without organs is not opposed to organs as such, but to the organic organization of the organs called the organism. The organism being equated with fixed hierarchies and organized by an internal log logic of function. This organism lacks the multiplicity of directives that are ignited by desire. Cut. Consider the body stripped. Stripped of content, of gender codes, of political codes. Consider the body as a site as a primary surface for signification, like the surface of the earth or a blank page. It's a surface for temporary texts, like the advertisements projected across public spaces onto the heads of bald men from H.G. Wells. It's a surface for permanent texts, produced, for example, by the strange legal and public torture machine from the penal colony that automatically carries out capital punishments while inscribing the sentence on the condemned man's skin. Consider the body as designed, that is, stripped of cultural fixity. Conversely, consider the body as signed, a coded site, a cultural field. Cut. 
consider a cut through the body, a cut through the body and through time, perhaps a cut through a moment of desire or through a moment of terror. Hinge. The hinge describes the rotation in one axis about a fixed point. <coughs> hinge is the Earth's axis. It's a cardinal point on a compass. It's the strategic point in a battle position of an army. It's a basic issue or determining factor, a turning point. A decision that's hinged is pending. It can go this way or that. Hinge may be a contrary machine, an object of precision in the, in the service of indeterminacy. A mirror is an instrument for hinging real images into virtual ones. Androgyny may be a gender hinge. Where the cut divorces, the hinge is sometimes conciliatory. Cut. I've elected to show a group of projects, uh, two of which are old. Uh, one is recent and one is ongoing in production. And each of them attempts to address in some way um, our concerns with the evaluation and the reevaluation of the body's relationship with architecture. And uh, I should just say that all the work that I'll show has been done collaboratively with my partner, Ricardo Scofidio. A delay in glass, or the rotary notary, is an architectural theater work based on Duchamp's bride stripped bare by her bachelor's even, or the large glass, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. The project is a probe into the instability of gender. The performance explores the fictive identities of male and female as fabricated by social structures. The body is a site for cultural inscriptions, relations of domination, of submission, of equation. It's a circuitous anti-narrative. The objective is irreconcilability between male and female, between image and word. Visual and textual languages are simultaneous and sometimes coincidental. There are seven animate components. Four of them are human. The field, the apparatus, the bachelor's bed, the female element, the bride, the male element, the bachelor, the oculist witness, the juggler of gravity, the field. The vertically stacked domains of bride and bachelor in the large glass are hinged 90 degrees to the floor into a site plan. In the large glass, the horizontal bar separating the zone of the bride from that of the bachelor is now translated into the dotted line that cuts the stage in half. It creates a front and rear relative to the audience. One half of the stage becomes the domain of the bride, the other half the domain of the bachelor. The characters can exchange location. The apparatus. The columns at the dividing line support the two hinged components of the apparatus. One is the revealing panel, the mirror, hung from the top of the columns. The other is the obscuring panel, an opaque wall cantilevered from the column, it's on the left, and it's in position on the right spinning. The first hinge, the obscuring panel. When rotated into position between the supports, the panel reinforces the division of the stage, separating male from female physically. To the audience, the character behind the panel is always hidden from view. The panel rotates 360 degrees on a pivot any 180 degree rotation allows the bride and bachelor to exchange places. They may never occupy the same domain at the same time. The chase, bachelor, I adore you, bride, I'm taboo for you. Bachelor, I adore you, bride, I'm taboo for you, and so on. Here, the hinge is a kind of desire mechanism, offering both temptation and denial. The hinge becomes a kind of spatial prophylactic. Its futility is like the litany of the chariot from the green box. Slow life, vicious circle, onanism, horizontal buffer of life. Bachelor's life regarded as an alternating rebounding on this buffer. Cheap construction, beer professor, tin cords, iron wire, crude wooden pulleys, eccentrics, monotonous flywheel. The second hinge. The revealing panel is a mirror. It's suspended in the same plane as the obscuring panel, 
and pivoted back 45 degrees to reflect the rear portion of the stage. The mirror is a surface hinge. It rotates plan into elevation and elevation into plan, subverting gravity in the process. The mirror reflects to the audience the image of the character behind the obscuring panel. The bride lies prone on the floor beyond. She's reflected hovering as the object of desire. Gravity and desire are both forces of nature and of culture. So the apparatus composed of one panel that cuts the stage and obscures half, and one panel that hinges the image of what's obscured, provides the optical mechanism that allows the audience to see one character actually and the other virtually. The bride and bachelor are always separated physically, but connected virtually by the apparatus. They will never consummate. Their performances are simultaneous and dialectical. The apparatus is a reconsidered proscenium. Originally, the theater of illusion required a division, a frame. Proscenium means literally pro, in front of, scenium, the scene, in front of the scene. This apparatus is a kind of intercenium, bisecting the scene, bisecting the narrative spatial condition of the stage, yet reconciling it back through artifice. So in the introduction of the bride, and this was shot in the rehearsal space, the bride attaches her leash to the pivot point at the dividing line of the stage. She describes her radius, makes her way around the rear half of the stage. She falls to the ground as the obscuring panel is positioned and the mirror is lowered. The bride hangs herself from her leash. And in the production, The rotation of plan to elevation by the mirror turns the pivot hinge into a pendulum, the leash into a noose, the wasp on a leash into the pendulum, constraint into willingful death, the verb to hinge into the verb to hang. Incidentally, the word hinge is etymologically derived from hang. <laughs> the bachelor's bed. The plane of the headboard sometimes replaces the obscuring panel at the dividing line. The bachelor's head penetrates through the aperture of the headboard after the bed is wheeled forward. His head is revealed to the audience, his body is reflected by the mirror as floating above. His disembodied head recites a chain of commands to his beheaded body. His body responds. This cut allows for the separate conceptual and corporeal action, actions of the bachelor. His head recites. Meticulous, these phantom mechanics. I am eliminated back to this dream stage still, moving forward through the day, backward through the night, forward and backward. What place is this? Here is the language of the rejected land. Here is the language of the dispossessed body. My fatal exile into fiction. My impossible exodus into night. My solitary machine worked by the eros of death. His body. It performs a harrow's motion. Left hand pulsates and rolls. Right hand follows. Legs randomly respond in quick jerks. The Bachelor. The nine mallet molds may be regarded as fractions of the masculine element. He is introduced as an apparition, projected one fraction at a time. The bachelor comes from a mold. He's an archetype. The bride. The bride is a physical specimen. She's exoskeletal. Her anatomy is a hinge. She wears chastity armor and she's well oiled. The oculist witnessed. He's the eyewitness, the voyeur, the narrator. He's the controlling eye and the controlling mouth. He governs the visual apparatus and conducts stage business. The juggler. He is an auto marionette, weight and counterweight. Gravity adjusts his will. 
He is the master of black humor. He is the tender of levity and gravity. So everyone is in hot pursuit. The Oculus witness is in pursuit of the vanishing point. The juggler is in pursuit of the center of gravity. The bride is in pursuit of her fall. And the bachelor is in pursuit of his rise. Cut. <clears throat> the withdrawing room is an installation for the Cap Street Project in San Francisco. It's a probe into the conventions of the domesticated body and the complicitous role of architecture in sustaining those conventions. The 100-year-old house uh, is entombed in David Ireland's renovation on the right, which was done in uh, 1983. And this is the interior. Now the house serves as a studio, a gallery, and a living space for an ongoing artist in residency program. And as we lived there, the house became the pretext for the project. Is that fo focused? The withdrawing room contains two domestic fields, one fictive, the other actual. They coexist in the interval between the skin of the house and the skin of the irreducible domestic unit, the resident. Boundaries between the two fields are blurred by penetrations of private acts into the public domain and by public, public violations of the private domain. Through the narrative potential that objects possess, there is an intimation of human presence. Program. One, the property line. A legal principle, a moral limit the resident in relation to culture. The building envelope is the site with all its vulnerable apertures, physical and optical violations, and reconciliatory hardware. Two, etiquette, a social order, the correct order. The resident in relation to a subculture which is allowed to penetrate the envelope. Room and furniture formations as inscribed by social structures are sites. The table is the primary site. Three, intimacy, a private order the body of the resident in relation to another body. This involves issues of gender, desire, and denial. The bed is the primary site. Four, the narcissistic impulse. An internal order, the resident in relation to self. This includes the commodity-induced drive for uniqueness, as well as conformity, health obsessions, paranoid hygiene, and retarding the corrosions of age. The mirror is the primary site. Excerpt. Two intersecting walls cut the original space and quarters and locate the site for the bed, the central component. Beds. The bed is the place of submission, sexual submission, submission to gravity, submission to illness, submission to sleep. The heartbeat is the slowest and fastest in bed. The bed is a place of activity. King Louis XIV sought to, world, to rule the world from his bed, his seat of power. Bed is a site of union, Bed is a site of separation between consciousness and subconsciousness. Here, a double bed is cut in half along the axis of sexual contact and pinned together by a mechanical hinge at the point of intersection of the two walls, the honorific center of the house. In the closed position, the bed straddles a wall half to either side. Its occupants can unite, but generally remain in two separate spaces, a kind of spatial divorce. One half of the bed is stationary. Uh, the other half rotates 180 degrees to a position headboard to headboard, which is beyond this point. It's covered with a lead bed spread. There is no stable reading. Intimacy is a momentary condition, one radii. Domesticity here is mechanocentric, centrifugal, propelled away from the center. Excerpt. As this is a corner house, two sides of the envelope are on the street and vulnerable. A third side is adjacent to another private house and there is a three-inch cleavage between the two. 
So we placed a mirror within this existing light well along the three inch cavity between 65 and 67 Cap Street. The mirror is rotated 45 degrees to refract that three inch interstice. It appears as a laceration in the opposing wall. This property line, or rather property plane, is extended into the interior. It's expressed as an incision of the same dimension. We cut through the floor plane and everything in its path to reveal structural information normally privileged by sectional drawing. The archaeological strata of the original house, the crawl space, the earth below, and the floorboards reveal the fragility of the envelope. Excerpt. The entrance door is the primary violation of the envelope. It initiates the first reconciliatory piece of hardware, the lock. The chair lock apparatus cuts and penetrates the wall between interior space and vestibule to the exterior. When the chair moves toward the periphery, its horizontal extension deadbolts the exterior door. And here you could see the deadbolt in the clabbered siding of the original house that's entombed inside of Ireland's uh, renovation. I hope this is still standing. We patched the floor very well. <clears throat> draw, draw air, draw blood, draw out, as extract the essence from. We're interested in the convergence of architecture and drawing. Architectural connect, uh, conditions of minimal dimension, Automatic or assisted drawings that are unconsciously made by objects in domestic contexts, like intersecting rings left by coffee glasses, or uh, the dust under the bed that becomes its plan analog when the bed is moved, or the door swing that's etched into the floor because the door is slightly sagging on its hinges. Excerpt. The bed inscribes this program in the floor. Continuing with the subject of drawing, Architectural drawings generally are in advance of architecture, documents of intent. Successive drawings are steps toward the realization of architecture. Drawing, or more specifically, architectural notation, abstracts using mimetic and symbolic strategies. Notation abstracts from architecture experience. It abstracts away the third dimension. It abstracts away actual size and the immediacy of material. This abstraction reinforces the analytic information which is generally disturbed and overwhelmed by the sensuality of experience. It is common practice to try to retrieve experience in drawing, to return a semblance of the third dimension, to embody the quality of light and the anticipation of material, to suggest the presence of time and movement. We're attempting to do the reverse, to absorb notational principles directly into the architectural project. For example, the privileging of plan and sectional views, the condition of ubiquity, the deletion of gravity, the simultaneity of scales. And the intention is to, to create a vertiginous dialogue between sensation and idea. Excerpt. Given the context of a double height space and the existing bridge, we organize the elements at grade in such a way as to be seen in pure plan from the bridge. So partial perspectival views at eye level, synthesized by memory, are now challenged by a single ubiquitous view. We wanted this condition to also be inverted to see plan view from below, for example, the dining table and chairs. The floor plane of the existing bridge, that is the datum just under the feet, is graphically extended into the virtual second level, and that is the dotted line. Components rest on this imaginary floor plane. They can be seen at eye level from the bridge and in plan from below. This rotation of vantage point about the programmatic components exposes both normal and notational views. And this produces an oscillation between the experiential and the anal analytical. The viewer, given the cultural subject matter of house and the freedom of movement throughout the space, constantly fluctuates between voyeur and detached observer. Excerpt. You see the table and chairs from below. You walk up the stairs to the point of alignment between the floor datum and the eye. 
the table, table collapses into elevation. You pass through the virtual plane and confront the table and chairs normally, perspectively. The table is suspended by wires. Each chair is connected to the table by a mechanism which allows it to move back and forth as well as rotate about the center of the dinner plate. The table is a site of microorganization in which cultural codes are played out. We began to explore the spatial rules of that plane, of custom between host and guests, relations of gender, behavioral relations between consumer and the meal, formal relations of objects on and below the table surface. And this beginning of a drawing that was taken never finished. Generic furniture is used throughout the installation in order to limit programmatic associations. Some are fractured to render them functionless, then reprogrammed with the use of prosthetic devices. Excerpt. A rolling steel leg stabilizes the unsupported corner of the rotating bed, and a steel arc bridges a three-inch incision for the bed's unimpeded movement. Excerpt. The legs of a chair are extended in length to position the head in direct confrontation with the picture tube. Excerpt. The structure of a chair severed by incision is repaired. Excerpt. A chair missing its rear legs is equipped with a steel support which passes between the legs of the occupant to position a mirror before the face. For this simple bachelor machine, the mirror provides the vanquishing of separateness. Space is squeezed out. In the withdrawing room, the domesticated body is examined in relation to the house from one extreme in its legal relationship to the outermost skin of the envelope of the house. To the other extreme, the body's most intimate contact with a domestic artifact, the confrontation with the mirror. Here, the, the role of architecture opts to be inscriptive and descriptive rather than prescriptive. Cut. Parasite is an installation in the projects room of the Museum of Modern Art. From Bataille, according to the Great Encyclopedia, the first museum in the modern sense of the word, meaning the first public collection, was founded in France by the convention of July 27, 1793. The origin of the modern museum is thus linked to the development of the guillotine. Cut. Question. Is it possible to do a critical work about the institution of the museum while consenting to occupy it? In other words, can the target and the weapon be the same? Question. Can architecture, when removed from its normal position of cultural reciprocity and inserted into the museum context, retain its power without being exiled into art? Parasite is a probe into the museum institution and into the institutionalized body. The intention is to articulate and reconfigure relationships between the museum building and bodies, between the museum building and artifacts, between bodies and artifacts, and between bodies and bodies. The viewer is to come to understand him or herself as the irreducible museological unit. Specifically, the project looks at looking, since looking is the primary activity in the museum. This is the Museum of Modern Art, a historic museum. Art of the modern era was ocular-centric, that is, defined by the supremacy of sight. To achieve plastic autonomy, the viewer's eye had to be purified. Vision became acultural, atemporal, sequestered from the social domain. Parasite aims to inspect vision, however, vision that is menaced by culture. This includes scopophilia, the pleasure of looking. It includes the subject's productive role in the process of vision. It includes looking as a gendered act, vision as carnal, connected with des desire. It includes vision as a weapon and connected with power and dominance. It includes subjective and objective vision as expressed through perspectival versus cartographic systems of representation. Cut. The designated site, 
a 20 foot wide by 40 foot long by 11 foot high room at the northeastern corner of the museum lobby. A room defined by neutral walls, one wall freestanding, two finite and two open corners, a column in one corner, and an adjacency along the length to a glass wall um, that looks onto the sculpture garden. The project's room is the only space in the Museum of Modern Art dedicated to the exhibition of contemporary work and unmediated by institutional forces within. And for fear of contagion, it's ejected out of the main body of the museum and it's located between the main circulation hall and the cafeteria. Site specificity here required more than response to the physical features, rather to the context of museum as a cultural field. A museum is an institution for the transmission of knowledge and values that, to a large degree, it determines. It is an institution that continually exercises an authority to construct narratives. Narratives representing the dominant point of view as evidenced by practices of inclusion and exclusion. In this case, narratives determined by the rigid categories of modernist aesthetics, thematic associations constructed by curators, and chronologies based on the paradigm of the textbook. The institution is a political and economic construct <clears throat> ruled by market forces, corporate sponsorship, and special interests, which in turn become determinants of art. Specifically, this is an institution which recently acquiesced to surrender its air rights to a 52-story condominium in exchange for amenities provided by a developer to finance its expansion. It is an institution that is defined simultaneously as the sacred domain of high art in the profane realm of the commercial mall, a site for consumption, cruising, and social encounters. Cut. Only some of those issues can be articulated through architecture. The project. The project agitates the boundary of the designated room. It rejects containment. It calls into question the privileged space of art. The components penetrate the designated skin passively and aggressively into three remote locations in the museum, all places of physical transition. There are three constructions. Each construction has two parts, a video camera deployed to the remote location and a monitor within the room receiving live input from that location. These three locations are claimed, if only scopically, by the project. Their images converge inside the designated room. The museum as a physical site is regarded as an indifferent topography whose surfaces and features present possibi possibilities for occupation. The constructions are opportunistic. Each exploits the feature that is most immediate for structural and electronic uh, electrical sustenance. The guest structures adapt their form to accommodate their host sites. Using a limited taxonomy of physical relationships, they include suspending from, wedging between, clamping on, cantilevering off of, compressing against, and suctioning onto. Electricity is leached from nearby light sockets. Here, parasitism is a strategy of physical opportunism, as in biology. It's a strategy of social opportunism, as between a sycophant and host. And it's a strategy of interference, like the static on a radio, as cited by Michel Serre. Location one, the main entrance, the site of departure from the street the site of planned penetration through the first legitimizing frame of the institution. Here, substituting for the honorific grand entrance of the historic museum are four revolving doors, four valves for nonstop exchanges of bodies. The lobby ceiling at the museum entry is the host site. Four cameras held by spring-loaded spiders cling upside down to the ceiling. Each is centered directly above one of the four revolving doors. Within the room, each of four monitors receives the image from one camera. Together, the four monitors reconstruct and surveil the plan view through the entry wall.
Structurally, the monitors are suspended from tapered beams. The beams are forced into the vertical corners between wall and ceiling by perpendicular tension rods. Location two, the main stair, the site of sectional departure from the street. Here, substituting for the ceremonial grand stair of the historic museum is a mechanical stair an automatic conveyor. However, the function of elevating art into the rarefied domain above the street is preserved, and so too is the stage for the exhibitionistic theater of moving bodies. The existing column is the host site. Two cameras are cantilevered from the column toward the escalators in the lobby, and two monitors receiving live input from the cameras are cantilevered into the room. One camera is directed at the ascending stair, the other at the descending. The side-by-side -side monitors reconstruct the two halved images of the escalators, though separated by a steel blade. And the image is zoomed in tight so that the width between the handrails fills the screen. The vertical movement of the mechanical stairs provides a constant stream of bodies that are scanned across the fixed frame of the TV screen. The revolving doors and the escalators are conveniences of commerce rather than icons from the rarefied domain of high culture. They are apparatuses for the expedient transport of consumers through retail space. Both futile rotary mechanisms, both hypnotic, one transporting bodies in plan, the other in section. Location three, the rear doors. The site of planned penetration into the sculpture garden, a domesticated outdoors, the garden of the historic museum, is turned inside out into a protected artifact. A horizontal corner of the room is the host site. A video camera prop from one wall is aimed through the glass wall of the garden onto this convex mirror. And the mirror is cantilevered uh, from the exterior facade column. It's stabilized by suction cups. The mirror refracts, refracts the distorted image of the facade wall as seen from the outside to permit the observation of the passage of bodies between lobby and garden. The receiving monitor inside the room is held by a tapered horizontal column, which is compressed against the wall by tension members. Cut. The scopic circuits. Closed circuits, interrupted circuits, overlapping circuits, open circuits. The room is cut in half horizontally. The median line, that is the dotted line, coincides with the height of the average adult. The seven video monitors are centered on this datum. Live images from the remote locations in the museum are recontextualized into ficto real episodes within the room. Each episode has fictive observers whose presence is des designated by generic chairs. The fictive observers and the actual observers share optical possession of the monitors. The focal point of the monitor at the central datum becomes an optical hinge point, rotating live images from real into fictive space, reorienting gravity 90 degrees, 180 degrees. In structure three, the fictive observer is rotated 90 degrees about the optical hinge of the monitor. Actual wall becomes fictional floor. The horizontal median cuts the construction in half. The mirror reflects the exposed sectional information, now rotated upright. Wall studs become floor joists. For the actual viewer, there is a loss of perceptual coordinates, as fictional grade now coincides with the medium, the datum of the eye. The fictive viewer is trapped in a closed scopic circuit between two mirrors, oscillating between the narcissistic image of the face 
and the wide-angle view embracing the body. Extending into the next layer, the disembodied electronic iris in one direction and the disembodied electronic retina in the other receive images from the museum's exterior. The chair is a visceral aggregate, a libidinal, a libidinal machine composed of biological and technological systems. Overheard, a guard reprimanding a woman applying her makeup in the mirror of the narcissist's chair. Don't touch, woman, I'm only looking. Guard, you can look in the bathroom mirror down the hall. You don't need makeup anyway. Structure two. The fictive, the fictive observer is rotated 180 degrees above the, about the optical hinge of the monitor. The actual ceiling becomes the fictive floor plane. The monitors construct a ubiquitous view of penetrations through the entry wall. Separating the eye and the screen is a mask or a kind of scotoma, blurring yet permitting vision. The stencil text is from Bentham, citing the powers of vision and vision used as power. Overheard. We were probably being watched. They're probably watching us now. Is this legal? Reverse text is relieved from the surface of the chair, leaving an embossed impression that reads correctly in the flesh of the occupant. The text from Michel Serre reads, paraphrased, parole, parabola, parable. The parasite pays in parables. The word is made flesh. The parasite plays a game of mimicry. It plays at being the same. It minimizes its risks by lightly transforming its own body into the body of its host. The host consents to maintain it, to bend to its demands. The parasite exchanges hostility into hospitality, exchanges outside for inside. Overheard. If they didn't bother making it possible to read, why the fuck should I bother? The second chair observes the first. It has a prosthetic leg. The seat reads, the observer is in a position of parasite, not only because he takes the observation that he does not return, but also because he plays the last position. The observer is last in the chain of observables until he is supplanted. Overheard, man to unsuspecting woman. Interesting show, woman, yeah. Man, have you been to the Calif California photography show? Woman, not yet. Man, I'm going over there now. Would you like to join me? Woman, sorry, I'm married. Structure one. The fictive viewer is upright, normal to gravity. The second fictive viewer in the garden observes the first. It has a prosthetic leg. The scissor structure, when fully extended, positions the eye of the fictive viewer at the apex of the triangle formed by the structural cantilever from the column. This point coincides with the position of the actual viewer's eye. Though the lines converge at the eye, the diagram of humanistic perspective, the monitors instead undermine the perspectival viewing experience. The cone of vision is truncated by the screen, and if the screen is a window, it's an opaque one, creating a blind zone. Binocular vision is cut by a blade. Two monocular views are presented. One scanning the body from the back, the other scanning the body from the front. The fractured image is at once voyeuristic and interrogating. Overheard, two collegiate types. Barth wrote on the, intr the intrusion of the lens and the desire to pose, sort of like remaking your body in advance into an image. Look, she's adjusting her underwear. Where? She's flirting. Cut. The slow house, three conditions of view, one and two. From Jonathan Crary, the television and the car windshield are both characteristically 20th century apertures. Both reconcile visual experience with the velocities and discontinuities of the marketplace. 
Both offer infinite routes, but with an equivalence of all destinations. The third view, the picturesque, a nostalgic return. Real estate ads discern between ocean view, bay view, cove view, water view, waterside, waterfront, protected water view, etc. A thorough real estate nomenclature developed to subtly distinguish value in a market that feeds on the desire for optical possession. Optical possession of property beyond legal boundaries. The picture window is a commodification of nature. The slow house will be built in spring on a bluff site facing the bay in a development at North Haven Point, Long Island. Howard Silver entrepreneur and Susan Silver marketing consultant and owners of the adjoining site say, spectacular views just like Big Sur with better sunsets. We didn't want anything less for our beach house. The house is a probe exploring the domesticated eye. The house is predicated on three apertures the car windshield, the frame transit through vehicular space. I'm sorry. The television screen, the frame transit through electronic space, and the picture window, the scopic claim over unlimited space. The passage of the driver. The car stops at the end of the road. The road deflects up to support the roof. Vision through the windshield is extended through the resulting slot between road and roof. The car apparatus converts to car artifact. It's always on display. The passage for the resident. The door is the front facade. The width of the body and 18 feet high. The door pivots horizontally. Beyond the front door, the resident confronts a knife edge, which cuts the plan left, right, and section vertically. One half of the passage deviates to the right and ascends, and the other half remains level and veers to the left. Both passages terminate at the opposite end with the window to the view. The slow house is simply a door that leads to a window. And given its gradually expanding form, the program inevitably organizes itself hierarchically. Calculations derived from computer. The slow house is a decelerating curve. The passage is anti-perspectival. There are no visual axes, only constantly changing optical tangencies splintering from the curve. Vision is eroticized, the hostage of desiring eyes. the elevations. <coughs> At the wide end of the house, we devised a confrontation between the two domestic icons, the fireplace and the television. Today, the fireplace, though displaced from center, produces the symbol of heat. Its light still has the power to connect people socially. The television also has the power to connect people, despite their lack of proximity, with a kind of electronic weld. Its phosphorescent glow produces a different kind of light. The source of light and the source of information are one. And the interface of these two is particularly poignant watching broadcast presidential fireside chats or the hypnotic pyro slash electronic yule log burning in the TV console at Christmas Eve. Uh, on the left slide, the horn at the right is the fireplace, and the horn at the left is a perch for a video camera, and is mounted at an altitude of 45 feet. The camera is directed at the view, 
uh, and it transmits a live image to the monitor that's cantilevered um, from its base into the living space. The electronic view is seen simultaneously with and compressed against the actual view. But the horizon is displaced. From a Z and two knots, Milo asks Oliver, why do you like snails? Oliver, they're a nice form of primitive life. They help the world decay, and they're hermaphro hermaphroditic. They can satisfy their own sexual needs. Thank you.